Okay, that looks to be going. And so, like I said, this is going to be more of an FAQ session. And so we just have a general just PowerPoint here. I don't even think it's worth sharing with you guys and posting it to our training page because it's a bit more or less for Mary and I to kind of see where we left off, you know, when we're going through this, um, these FAQs with you. Um, but if you feel like this is something that you'd like us to post out there, we certainly can, but there's just no, not a whole lot of information on the PowerPoints. Um, and so, like I said, it is more of just um, an FAQ style format. And so we're going to answer the question by going in and showing you some of these things. Now, I know that we have covered, um, you know, the setting up type of things, um, you know, the resources that are out there to assist you with getting started and how to set up a district. But we've, again, made changes um, and we keep updating some of these uh, documents like the conversion guideline, the extracting data, you know, just stuff like that. So I wanted to review those with you again. Um, so, and talk about the changes that have been made to those since the last time that we have met. Let me get started on that. Okay. And so when it comes to setting up um, a district in ESS, um, we do have some resources out there for you. Uh, so we do have the installation guide and that installation guide that we have out there, and I'll take you to that here. Let me go to our homepage. And I've got that somewhere here. There we go. Um, so on our employee self-service documentation. So when you, go, when you go to the homepage, again, for those of you that really haven't, gotten in here yet to even see where all of this is at. Under the employee self-service documentation, uh, we do have three different links. So um, our public links, uh, the self-service user manual, um, that's a public link. Uh, the installation guide, I believe is a public link. Um, and the self-service uh, import from kiosk, um, that one again is also to, that's I think just for ITCs, allowing you then to follow the steps that you need to do to take extracted kiosk data and import it into ESS. So within, so um, those are the three main areas. So for the installation guide that I was talking about in the PowerPoint, this is for uh, locally hosted um, ITCs mainly. It goes through the steps on how to set up everything. I believe those of you that host with the Management Council, um, Chad um, has VRA options. Um, and I, you know, I believe he's um, you know, giving you guys that information on how to set up your districts via VRA into a blank instance in ESS. And he goes through all the steps there. Um, but um, for those of you that do not host with the Management Council, the installation guide is going to take you through all of that information. Um, the ESS import from kiosk guide. So that's where you're going in and getting those kiosk extracts and then deciding which ones you want to import into that blank ESS instance. And so we'll get into that because we've added new options in there. We'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, and then obviously we have our user manual. And within the user manual, underneath our appendix, so if I go back and go into our user manual, and I just scroll down to our appendix, we have um, a conversion guideline, and we have an extracting data out of kiosk guideline, which, um, you know, we really want you guys to refer to um, in order, you know, to get the ball rolling and how what needs to be prepared ahead of time um, and how to uh, import or take that extracted data out of the kiosk so that it can be imported into ESS. Um, and then we also have an ESS FAQ page that I just started to create yesterday. So that is not a whole lot in there right now. We're gonna add some of the information from the session in there. 
as well as other FAQs that just aren't, we don't have time to cover today. Um, so those will be included in there as well. And so just going back to our PowerPoint here. So, you know, the installation guide will allow you to set up that container, get the instance created. Um, and then um, I want to go through the conversion and then touch upon the import, the updates that have been made in there, and then go through the, um, you know, extracting data information as well. So let's get into those before we move on to the next slide. Okay. And so um, going to the conversion guide, which I, you know, like I said, stated is in the appendix. So we have updated this. Um, and, uh, and the only things that we I really wanted to touch upon in here, the major changes that we made was to the outstanding leave requests. So what this does is just a guideline. It's just recommendations. It's something you don't, you know, if there are certain things in here that you don't need to worry about, then that's fine. But we just wanted to bring some of these things to your attention um, so that you can prepare for this um, before you start converting your districts. Um, so the conversion timeline hasn't changed, so I'm, I won't uh, go into detail there. Um, so we've got an area that we can call like legacy kiosk. So this just basically talks about, you know, where your districts are at right now that are using kiosks to submit their leave requests. So um, one thing to keep in mind, and we've mentioned several times is that um, leave requests as they are now in kiosk are not going to be imported into ESS. So no leave request data is going to be in there. So if you've got, you know, uh, a user that has 10 leave requests, um, five of them have already been, or, you know, several years old, they've already been exported. The other five are outstanding. Maybe they're in progress or they've been approved but haven't been exported. None of the leave requests data will be converted and imported into ESS. So their leave balance information will be in there, but that's coming from USPS, just like it does now with kiosks. Um, but the actual leave request data will not import into ESS. So that will be included on one of the legacy kiosk extracts that are um, going that are out there so that you can archive those um, and we'll get into the extract information in a little bit. And I can tell you exactly where those are at. Um, so, but um, it's like I said, it's going to be on the archive data and not converted into ESS. So I have a question, how can we continue to proceed with this timeline when there are so many things that are not ready? Um, Marcia, could you, um, if you wanna, uh, unmute. I'm not quite sure. Could you explain that in a little more detail? Marsha, I think we're having trouble hearing you. Let me see if I can unmute you. You have said multiple things that are things that are not ready. Um, I, um, I said that, you know, we're still working with timesheets um, and that isn't going to be ready until production. And we are working on the ASAP information, which there are some changes. So again, right. And these are things that are going to be ready and they're supposed to be ready by production. So, and I, and I understand you have concerns, um, but, you know, we are trying um, our hardest to get all of this done um, by the beginning of July. Um, so, and that I know is next week. So, um, but yes, that's, that's the goal is that, you know, we're going to have this information out there. Um, the ability to go in and start creating your instances um, and your containers, your empty instances is there. Um, so it's, it's going to be, um, you know, you guys can do that information, do that now and get things ready to go. Um, one thing that what will the timeline be moved? I don't have an answer for that. I don't, as far as I know right now, it's not. Um, it's not going, um, it's still at the end of September. So if, you know, there are 
situations that arise that it needs to be pushed back, then it will. But I can't comment on that right now. Right now, we're sticking with the same conversion timeline that we've had. So I hope that helps. Um, so anyways, moving on. So, you know, these are things that you can discuss um, with your districts now in regards to, um, you know, trying to set up a conversion guideline. We do know we've been working with the, um, uh, the kiosk developers. Um, they're a group out of um, Peru, um, their name in some, and they have been working on the kiosk extracts and um, they have them up and running now nightly. So, um, and it's specific files. So um, I'll answer these questions here a little bit. So with those files, um, what's nice is that because they are being created nightly, we have uh, no USPS extract file and we have a timesheet extract file that are being done nightly. That no USPS extract file is the file that you're going to need to take the data out of kiosk and import it into ESS. Um, so like I said, that extract is running nightly so that um, you know production starts next week, you can go in and extract that data out of there and import it in. And because they're set up nightly, you can you know, schedule something with your districts in order to um, set up a date for them to stop um, posting leave requests in kiosk um, because those extracts are available on a nightly basis. It makes it much easier for you guys to schedule that uh, downtime with your districts in order to get them converted over into ESS. All right, so I'm going to stop there for a minute and I will talk about those extracts here in a little bit. Um, I just want to go back and look at some of these questions. So is ASAP districts going to be able to start migrating starting Monday, which is production date? I can't say when the production date, I was told it was July 1st. So, um, you, you know, once I get more information um, from the development team regarding that, once we're in production mode, the ASAP information is ready, then you'll be able to start um, converting your ASAP districts. But until that is ready and we tell you it is, um, I wouldn't proceed until that's done. We have already coordinated and planned out our migration schedule with our districts. And with it being fiscal year end, and, and I understand that we don't have enough time with a tight time frame of 90 days to revamp it. If those are concerns that you have, I would strongly recommend that you talk to your directors and you know and express your concern about the timeline. Um, right now, you know, the actual conversion part is um, from what I you know am seeing is going to be relatively quick. This isn't a USAS or payroll migration. Um, it's basically going in, converting the setup information, and they start processing in ESS. So all the archived data and stuff like that is like the leave requests are in that archived extracts. And then the rest of the information is being synced with USPS like it was in kiosk. So that sync will take place, you know, when you're creating these instances. So it isn't, um, you know, as there isn't as much work involved in it as there was with the other migrations. I think we're all kind of, you know, concerned about, you know, is this going to be like USAS and payroll? Um, and so at this point, um, it doesn't sound like it is. It's going to be a smoother process. Oh, hey, any Michelle. Other questions? Yes. Andrew, yes. Um, so I don't know how many have done this, but we, we did do, we have test instances and we've, I've extracted the data over and it really, I know that helped me feel a lot better about it. It really didn't take, I mean, the import process I have so far found just a couple little things here and there that maybe weren't exactly the same as the kiosk or maybe some new things in ESS. There's some new fields that were in kiosk. And once I do a couple more, uh, I'm going to put a ticket in because I'm sure we could note that stuff and it would be none of it's major. It's all it's easy. And I just compared the kiosk to the test, you know, um, and yeah, it, it's nothing like 
you know, I mean, because we're not pulling the leave request over, you're not really balancing to anything. You're just making sure that the setup looks the same. Like I said, there were a couple things here and there. I'll put a ticket in, I'm sure. Uh, how long did the conversion take me? Maybe an hour and a half. I don't know. And that was double checking everything. The actual conversion, probably more like 45 minutes. I've, I'm not going to lie to y'all. I'm doing one right now on my other screen. So, um, because, the, you know, I'm thinking about it and I'm sitting here, you know, and so um, it's not, no, it, you know, it, it is, it's, it's a great process. Um, I think I've gotten one file kicked back, kicked back to me um, so far. Um, and I, that was something I would ask, was going to ask on the FAQ. My user's file had, invalid characters in a password field and i was like i don't know why i need to import passwords either it was like random users had passwords so i just deleted those and you know then it imported which i assume was okay but it's a test yeah. so even if it wasn't okay oh well um <laughs> so well, no it's it been just to give confidence like i don't really feel like it is still a tight window i am still concerned about that and if i had a bunch of districts integrated with asop I would also be concerned about that. All of ours dumped that because of the problems and are excited that it is now going to be in SSDT's hands to make that connection better. But it really wasn't. And and you guys can do that now. Like, let's say they say, hey, July 1, it's not ready. I, I feel like everybody should just start spinning up test instances and just pulling them over. You can give them to your districts and then be like, does this look the same? Or you can do it. You know, right, and that's and that's what the whole early access was for, and that's what we can. Yeah, it, it's been going you know, well. It's, it's a test period, um, and yeah, and I understand we can't really test out the districts on ASAP yet because we're still, you know, working on that. Um, but yeah, as long as you know you're in there, getting familiar with the process, like Andrew said, um, and realizing you know the actual conversion part isn't taking that long. Um, and with the kiosk loads that we have in ESS, they do produce errors. Um, and so those are things that, you know, if there is an error, you'll be able to look over that information, you know, and if there's something that doesn't make sense, that's where you create a ticket to us and we'll, you know, guide you through that. Um, but, you know, we haven't um, had a lot of, uh, uh, tickets yet in regards, which is, is a little concerning because I figured we would get more, um, and, you know, during this early access phase when you're doing test imports. So, um, you know, if production is ready sometime next week, then, uh, you know, it's like, you know, Andrew said, it's a good idea to get your feet wet and just go in there and start creating these test instances and just, you know, go through um, doing a test import one of the districts and uh, see what it does. But like I said, you're not like you're bringing over kiosk data. You're bringing over kiosk setup information, the workflows, um, the users, um, the groups, you know, the group chains, um, stuff like that. But the actual, uh, like the leave balances are the leave information is getting calculated when you're syncing back to USPS. So that's pulling the leave balances from USPS into the leave information in ESS. Um, so, you know, that's, um, so I understand the nervousness and stuff, you know, but, um, you know, once you, you know, get a little, your feet wet and get a little more comfortable, you know, it should be a relatively smooth process for you, so. And um, so another question here is we have sent multiple tickets um, with it being fiscal year ended is a challenge yep, to cover out the extra time to test and, and uh, we understand that. Uh, we would also love to know the list of JIRA issues bugs to be fixed. Um, you have access to JIRA, um, so you guys can access the ESS JIRA project and review that information that is out there and available for you guys to look at. Um, we have an ESS JIRA project. Let me go into JIRA. And if you guys have created dashboards, that's great. That's how I keep track of everything. 
Um, and I've set up a dashboard for all the ESS JIRA issues. We also have an ESS feedback issue that's out there or project as well, that you can view that. Um, but you know, you can go in here and you can filter in the project by you know what's still outstanding, um, like the status here. These are all, you know, right that we're seeing on the screen here are all outstanding ones, but I can go in you know, set the status to those that are still outstanding um, and review, you know, what's out there. You can also filter by what's been scheduled um, for release. Um, so Mark has that displayed as well, the fixed version. Um, and you can go in and do a filter in the JIRA project on the actual fixed version and, um, and see what's coming up on the next release, what's scheduled. So yeah, so that information is out there already for you guys to go in and review what's sitting out there in ESS. And like I said, we have an ESS, our core project, and then we also have a feedback project. And obviously if there are things that you want um, that aren't out there already, or your districts are requesting, um, that's where we relay that information back to the developers and either recreate um, a project or an issue in the core project, or, you know, if it's some kind of enhancement, um, then we will create an issue in our feedback project. Um, but, um, but yes, you can go out there and kind of see where we're at already. Um, and it, it does go quick. They are really um, completing these at a fast pace. Um, you know, we're handling per release about between 20 to 30 issues at a time. So um, lots of information um, happening. So it's always good to go out there and uh, review the release and the release notes. Um, we will start now that we will be in production. Um, this will be you know, included on our recap sessions with you guys as well. Um, but yes, that information is out there and available for you. Okay, any other, I'm gonna stop here if anyone has any questions in the chat or you know, you wanna unmute yourself, you certainly can. Andrew, I appreciate um, you, um, you know, letting us know how things are going with your ITC and uh, anyone else that's been doing any type of test imports and wanna share their experiences as well, I would appreciate it. So thank you, Andrew. Okay. So going back to um, our guidelines here, um, one thing that, uh, you know, regarding to the legacy kiosk is like I said, that actual leave request will not get imported. Um, you know, you want to start planning those dates um, as to when the districts will stop um, entering information in kiosk and start entering uh, their information to ESS. So um, these are things that the ITC and the districts need to discuss, you know, similar to what you guys did with, you know, our other migrations. Um, and then um, if you, you know, what are, one of our recommendations is to uncheck that leave request option in kiosk after the district's deadline date so that people don't mistakenly post leave request in kiosk after you've already converted to ESS. Um, so again, these are just you know, recommendations we have. Now, one thing I wanted to delve into a little bit more are these outstanding leave requests. And we have a couple of recommendations, but that's what they are, just recommendations. If you and your districts have found a better way to handle these outstanding leave requests that works for you, that's awesome. Um, but we just wanted to, you know, to kind of go through a couple different options um, as to how you want to handle them. Um, so, you know, just to touch upon what an outstanding leave request is, it's one that hasn't been exported yet. So that could be an, an, a newly submitted one. Um, that could be one that's been partially approved in the workflow. We call that an in process. Um, and it could be one that's fully approved, but has not been exported into USPS. So those are your outstanding ones. So 
if, you know, what you're probably going to run into is that you're going to have outstanding leave requests after your deadline date. They, you probably have districts that have already submitted leave requests for next year, um, for this fall, um, stuff like that. So you have to, you know, communicate with them and how you want to handle these outstanding leave requests, because as I said, they're not being imported. Um, and so you have two different options or whatever else you guys have worked out with your districts. But if you want to make it easy, um, those outstanding leave requests, you can have the users re-enter those in ESS. So if you have a user that has five leave requests that they submitted, you know, this fall, early next year, um, they can view those in kiosk right now underneath um, their, their leave request to see what's sitting out there. And there is a way to download that information um, for them to download it into a spreadsheet, to use that spreadsheet as a template. And then once you are on ESS, the district's on ESS, they can re-enter those leave requests and then it'll go through the workflow in ESS. So that's one way to handle it is just whatever, you know, every employee is responsible for seeing what they have and then going out there and re-entering them in ESS once you're on that system. Um, has, you know, if anyone is, you know, would like to share what they have um, decided to do with their ITC or with their districts, please feel free to, to chime in. Um, but, you know, that's one way to do it. And what we have um, down here is how the users can get that information. Um, with their user access, they can go under leave requests and there's a my request in process option and they can download any of their leave requests that are currently initiated or in progress into a spreadsheet and pull that in. Um, also, um, if there's another option in there, my processed requests. So these are ones that have been fully approved. It's gonna contain ones that are fully approved and also exported. So they would have to filter on the status for approved only. And then they can download those approved leave requests in the spreadsheet as well. So there's two different areas that they can do that. Do you have uh, Marsha comment for leaves in the future? I told them to finish approving them and create the export file for the various periods. Uh, name the, hold on here. Name the export file with a pay date. They would use it, save it and export it later so they don't have to re-enter. So um, you're saying that you're going to have the, so you're saying that with this option, Marsha, you're basically, it sounds like you're going with option two um, because in that situation, option one is making the users re-enter it, okay? Any outstanding requests, making them re-enter that information in ESS. So, like the payroll person does not have to keep track of those approved leaves um, or outstanding leaves. They are just saying whatever's sitting out there outstanding needs to be re-entered. And you know, it's up to the, you know, the district. Uh, you know, they, they could have a lot of them, right? So if they want their users to re-enter that stuff in, obviously they're going to re-enter them in ESS. Now the other option here is if they don't want the users to re-enter their outstanding leave requests in ESS, they're going to go in and um, this is probably falls more on the payroll person at the district because what they can do is that, you know, those are out there, they can make sure before September 30th that all of those um, are fully approved or before they're done, their district is done with kiosk and, you know, before they start on ESS, they make sure that all of those outstanding leave requests have been fully approved. So they're at the fully approved uh, status and we have that marked here. 
And then up until September 30th, um, the kiosk leave manager, or payroll person, um, the leave expert administrator can continue using that export approved district request option in kiosk to fully extract those or to extract those fully approved absences in order to post them into USPS. So, so, and you know, and do it for that particular pay period, okay? But after September 30th, when ESS or when kiosk is no longer um, accessible, um, so that what they wanna do is they make, sh make sure that they run a final export of the remaining fully approved requests. So if they still have requests for October, November, December into next year, they can do a final export, save that spreadsheet. And so they're going into that export approved district request, doing a final export to create a spreadsheet. And then they can use that spreadsheet to import the approved absences into USPS for that specific payroll. So that is putting more work on the um, treasurer's office in order to keep those in check. But it is a way, you know, that it, it's an option instead of making the users re enter those approved leaves in ESS. So I hope that makes sense. These are two options that, you know, we have come up with that they can do. But again, if you guys have come up with something even easier um, or more convenient for your districts, that's great. And if you wanna share that information, please do so in chat or, in, um, or unmute and tell us what you have done. So that, that's why we kind of took this outstanding leave request and made it its own little area because we just wanted to, you know, give you those, those options that uh, we have come up with. Any questions on that? Okay. So if you have uh, workflows that are not being used in kiosk, that have never been used, um, you know, they can clean that information up prior to conversion. Um, so if, you know, you are a district that is using leave, you know, you have a district that is using leave requests, um, but there are workflows in there that they never use that are no effect on um, your workflows at all. Those can be cleaned up prior or they can be cleaned up afterwards. Um, it's one of the conversion options um, when you're converting the data um, using the kiosk extracts, and it's gonna pull in your groups and group chains. So, um, so if you, know, you have the time or you want to clean that stuff so it doesn't get imported in into ESS, um, you can ahead of time. If not, like I said, it can be done later when you have the time and you can clean those up in ESS. And one other thing as well is that we do strongly recommend um, that you guys, you know, talk to your districts about the archival process and how you guys are going to archive those legacy kiosk extracts. Um, the biggest concern that off the top of my head would be the leave requests. Um, is making sure that you know those leave that leave request data from kiosk is being archived in case you ever need to pull up uh, one of those leave requests. Um, and we'll talk about that stuff here in a little bit, um, the actual extracts. Um, those are the biggest things I wanted to talk about. The rest of this information is stuff that was has already been out there um, in regards to um, employee self-service and the steps here. We didn't make any changes really in here or the post import steps. The main thing I wanted to cover since the last time we talked was the actual conversion um, of the outstanding leave requests um, and how to, how to handle outstanding leave requests in kiosk. So that was the main thing I wanted to discuss in regards to the conversion steps. 
Okay. Um, the actual extracting of the kiosk data. So let's talk about that before we go in and actually go into the kiosk import steps. So we have, again, in our appendix, another page regarding the extracting data out of kiosk. So this is a really important part um, to read and follow um, because this basically tells you how you can go out there and find those extracts in the kiosk test environment um, and then download those. And, um, and then we'll go through our ESS import of data into um, the kiosk extracts into ESS here in a little bit. Okay, so this extracting data out of kiosk, again, um, this is in the test instance. And this is where um, our, the developers um, uh, that from Insum have really been working hard on getting this um, done on a nightly extract. And you guys have probably seen that. For those of you that have gone out here to take a look at your district's extracts, um, you can see that you'll, you'll see some created extract files that are being run nightly. And that's what um, we have worked out with them. So I wanna talk about what you're seeing when you log in to the kiosk test instance, those extract files are stored under this URL, kiosk test. It's not in their live. Um, we, you know, they were very concerned about, you know, it's causing any uh, performance issues on their live instances. So that's why the kiosk developers um, have, are storing the extracts on this test instance, which is basically a backup instance. So all of you, um, I, I believe all the ITC staff, um, I didn't, I spot checked a few people, uh, not everyone, but you should have some type of ITC kiosk administrator role in the existing kiosk. Um, and so when you log in to this test instance, you're logging in using the same login credentials you use for the live instance. So if you're thinking, how do I log in here? It's the same thing. Um, so whatever username and password you're working, you're using to log into uh, the live kiosk, you're going to use those same login credentials to log into the test kiosk. Um, and so when you log in, I've got a screenshot here, you are going to look for the ITC kiosk administrator menu because you have the ITC kiosk um, administrator role. And so when you click on that, um, and that's first step here, then you're gonna go down to um, update, delete district configuration. And that's step two. That is going to take you to your districts. It's gonna show you a grid of your districts in kiosk whether they're active or not, um, it's gonna display all of your districts. Um, and so you would, you know, obviously doing some research as to who's still using kiosk, who isn't, um, you know, and uh, then you'll know which ones you wanna take their extracts and download so that you can import that kiosk setup data into ESS. So once you, you know, look at your districts, they're going to be lined up here, then in order to see the extracts, you have to click on the IRN for that district. And so then what happens is the kiosk export extracts are going to be located at the top of the screen once you click on the IRN. And so let me show you here. I've got one. So this is kind of our test uh, instance that we have. And this is what you're going to see. And it looks a little bit different than my screenshot that I have here, only because the PS developers have been working on that nightly extract. Um, this screenshot is a little old. Um, so, you know, we'll see some way back from, from uh, May. And we've got several different zip files named. So I wanna go through all the zip files you, you're gonna see. But one thing you're definitely gonna see is multiple versions, updated versions 
um, of the, especially the no USPS and possibly the time sh timesheet ones, because those are going to be extracted on a nightly basis. And so that's what you're seeing in here is you're seeing the no USPS. So you'll see one from, you know, the other last night, you'll see one again from the night before. So this is just a newer version of that no kiosk, no USPS um, zip file. This is the zip file that contains the extracts you need to import into ESS. So that's why this is running on a nightly basis because you need this information, um, the most up-to-date information in order to get that um, imported into, um, and that way you can easily schedule your um, conversions with your districts knowing that you have a new version of this file every night. Um, we also, for those that are using timesheets, that one is also being updated nightly. And so we only have just a handful of districts using timesheets, um, but you'll see an updated version of that every night as well. And so let's talk about um, each of these. So when you're ready. Hey, Michelle. Yes. Um, so now that these are coming nightly, I feel like I had heard Matt say, like, this was the big thing that we were waiting on, right? Like nobody was going live. With, without updated data. I mean, that one was pretty obvious. But now that this is happening, what what specifically, other than obviously timesheet districts, ASOP districts, like that's, that's a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. But districts that aren't in that position, what specifically are we waiting for to get the ball rolling on moving them over? You know, and I'm really, I'm thinking like us, meaning WOCO, you know, like I, we can go first and we're small enough that if it, if it burns, you know, out the first week in July, we just people put things on pieces of paper, you know, so, but I just want to, you know, I want to get the ball rolling on stuff. So right. I had thought this was what we were waiting for. And then I log in this morning and I see it. So. Right. And this really, this really was it, Andrew. The only thing, and let me go back to all of these files so I can talk about each one of these extract files that you're going to possibly see in here, because you may see a bunch of versions of the no USPS, but I want to talk about the other ones too, um, just to you know let you know what's in each of them. We are still um, you know, confirming a couple things with, we just sent a message to the NSM developers yesterday on some of these other files. But yeah, our main concern was that no USPS one, because that contained all those CSV files that you needed to um, get all that, you know, any updates that have made, been made to users, workflows, um, you know, subcategories, stuff like that, um, ASAP uh, configuration information. That was, um, we wanted to make sure that um, that was done on a nightly basis um, so that any changes that were made to any of the setup information is there for you guys so you don't have to worry about missing anything right um and so yeah that's i mean once <clears throat> you know i i guess i'm leery of saying you know wait until we announce production because we haven't announced it yet and hold off until production but yeah that was the biggest thing is making sure that this no USPS was the one that was done nightly. So let me talk about that here. So, um, so what you're going to see, let me go back because I want to talk about the difference here. Like you, like I said, you're going to see a ton of no USPS, and you'll see too that you can, you know, scroll through these, and what you're going to find is you're going to see a bunch of no USPS. Uh, this district may not use timesheets, so that's why we don't see any timesheet information. Um, but in here, you're also going to see um, Ippy Dippy. Um, so if they are using Ippy Dippy, um, then it does do an extract. Now, what are you going to do with an Ippy Dippy extract if they're still using Ippy Dippy, right? Because they're going to be using Ippy Dippy in legacy kiosks until at least next July. So that 
extract may not be real important at this point to download uh, because it's constantly changing. Um, but they are working on, you know, getting those extracted out, out of there. So, um, and you'll also see one called in USPS. So you'll see again that that one, we don't have a more recent version of that one since uh, mid-June. So what we are confirming with the kiosk developers is for these other extract files, which would include the Ippy Dippy and the in USPS, are they going, I think they're so focused on the no USPS one right now, how often are they going to refresh these other files? And the last conversation we had with them, it was um, supposed to be uh, weekly. Um, so I think, you know, they're just wanting, they were really focusing on getting these other ones to run nightly. We're waiting to hear back from them regarding the other ones. So let's talk about those. Okay, and so, like I said, the timesheet one is one that is going to be generated nightly. Um, and that's one of them that they're working on. And this is going to be the name, naming convention of that zip file. So each of these zipped files are gonna contain several CSV files in them. So it's like a folder of all of the CSV files in here. And so this is going to contain the timesheet related data. Um, and like I said, I don't have um, more information about this because, you know, it's with the timesheets where we don't have everything out there, you know, and documented regards to this. So once we get the information we need, we will let you know. Um, but um, this is the TS stands for timesheets, and it's going to contain any information from kiosks regarding timesheets into a zipped file. Um, you know, what you can do is go out there and pull one of your districts and download one of these zip files and, you know, op open, unzip it and take a look and see the CSV files that are out there just so you can see what all is out there and how large these are. Um, but these are things that um, you will need to kind of discuss with the IT, with your districts as to how you guys are going to store these zip files for archival purposes. Um, and then the next one, which is the one we've you know, been focusing on is the no USPS. So this contains a lot of the CSV files. I don't have all of them highlighted that you could possibly import into ESS. I just have a handful of them here. Um, the ESS import from kiosk manual goes through all the different um, track files that can be imported into ESS. So here are some of them that are listed in here. Now, like I said, the Ippy Dippy one contains any Ippy Dippy related. So, you know, it's kind of easy to kind of tell which one's timesheet, which one's Ippy Dippy. You guys know that the no USPS has got the extracts. So, you know, you can see kind of the pattern here um, of the archive data. And this zip file will only be generated, obviously, if the district is using or has used Ippy Dippy uh, in kiosk. Um, and so again, you got to think about this. Um, do I really need to extract this at this point and you know and archive this? Because if they're continuing to use Ippy Dippy, um, I shouldn't have to worry about this at this point. Um, as far as I know you know, these extracts will continue to run. And this would be one that I'm assuming is going to be run on a nightly or on a weekly basis um, that, um, you know, it will be available to extract and archive when Ippy Dippy is done in kiosk or when the district is done with Ippy Dippy in kiosk. And then the fourth one here is um, a kiosk in USPS. And so this contains other kiosk related data. I have not gone through these to see you know, like what is in each one. Um, this is kiosk data. I don't know how he's going about uh, naming these. I do know that um, 
These do contain the leave request ones, and you're going to see them noted under leave requests, but I have not gone in here to take a look at each of these to say, what's the difference between kiosk leave request, kiosk leave request, archived, kiosk leave request, and backup? I don't know what all of those are, um, but um, it does contain the leave request data. And so if for some reason, you know, a district needs that information um, to pull up something from a leave request from last year and they want to view that, they can, you notice these are all in a CSV file format, they can go in and uh, open up one of these in Excel and find information in here. I did go, I think I pulled up one of them, I can't remember, it's been a while ago. Um, and it was, you know, I searched on a name and boom, it took me right to that. Um, and if I wanted to filter them by a date, you know, if I know it was in the last year, I could do that. So it didn't take me long to find a, like the lead request I was looking for. Um, it's just kind of going through to figure out which one. Um, and I, you know, I haven't looked through these to specifically say. Um, it might be that some of these might be in progress versus approved versus exported, I don't know. Um, it might be split out by dates. Um, we might have ones for the current year and one and ones from prior year, I'm not sure. But anything with the leave request um, are things that, you know, you need to go back and look at something, you would be looking at those particular CSV files. So that's, oh, these are under the NUSPS one. Now the last two um, that could be created, um, is a kiosk files and a kiosk dippy dippy files. And these zip files will only be created if there were attachments on the leave request or on the ippy dippy form. So um, if they never used attachments um, in kiosk or ippy dippy, then these files will not be generated. So, like I said, there could be six different files, the timesheets and the no USPS are going to be done nightly. The rest of these, as soon as we have confirmation um, with the in some developers, the chaos developers, as far as I know for now, these are supposed to be done weekly. And once we know informa more information from them, we will pass that on to you guys. So it's really, up to you um, and the districts as to when you want to archive, you know, some of these files. Um, you know, right now you need the no USPS one to actually complete the conversion, right? Um, but some of the other information, when do we do this? Are we going to do it later on this fall? Um, you know, and you know, once I get more information too, I know that, you know, kiosk availability, what is called availability by September 30th, will you guys still be able to go in and see these zip files um, after September 30th in kiosk? Um, that's, that's the stuff I need to confirm, um, or is it gonna completely be, I don't know how it could it be, because if you're still using Ippy Dippy, you should still be able to see this information. That'll give you time. Um, as to how you want to archive some of this information. So I don't know exactly for sure um, how that's going to work yet. So once we get that information, uh, we'll share that with you. Um, but I just wanted to at least show you where it's at. If you guys weren't familiar with it already, you're going to find it again in this test instance. And depending on your role, and like I said, I haven't checked every ITC support staff, but um, for the ones I did check, looks like most of you have this ITC kiosk administrator role. And if you do, you can go in, log into this test instance, look at your districts, click on the IRN, and then it will take you to that particular, you scroll up to the configuration window and you scroll up to the top, and you'll see your kiosk export files. Um, what one other thing too, when you're kind of looking at, you know, the extracts on here, it's kind of good to see what is this district using kiosk for? 
you know, are they using it for just um, W-2s and pay slips? Maybe they aren't using uh, the leave request information at all. Um, so obviously those fields are going to be unchecked if they aren't using leave requests. Um, and so that could help too when you're ready to convert because if they aren't using, they weren't using leave requests and the workflows in kiosk to begin with, that data doesn't have to be imported then into ESS because why would you import workflows that they've never used, right? Maybe they started using them or something and they and then they're like, check this, you know, unchecked it because yeah, we're using something else instead. <laughs> then you wanna make you know sure if this is unchecked here, then when um, the instance is set up and you're converting the configuration information, which is the kiosk functionality, if the leave request is unchecked in here, it's going to say unchecked in ESS when it converts over. Um, and so with that being said, let me go into, okay, I've downloaded these. So you use this link to download the zip file. And then obviously you would open that zip file to get to those specific CSV files in the no USPS. And then what you're going to do, go back. is you're going to go to the import from kiosk guide that takes you through those see those um strict files that you just downloaded and you're going to go through this import process to import that setup configuration into ESS. So here is the outline of the import process. <clears throat> and so the district configuration was the one I just talked about, the, uh, the uh, functionality. So again, if you don't have leave requests checked in kiosk, it's going to show in this district configuration. And let me go down to that first one. Here is the district, uh, uh, basically what's involved in the spreadsheet. So for this one, you're going to find the, whatever their IRN number, underscore kiosk, underscore districts, dot CSV in that no USPS uh, extract folder. And you're gonna take that and you're gonna go into um, system, kiosk load and ESS, and you're gonna upload this file and select the kiosk districts. I'm just using this one as an example. And so, like I said, if you're going in here, it's gonna pull all this information in. So if some of these um, aren't being used, like leave requests, then it's going, the flag's going to be false. And when that then gets converted um, and imported into ESS, when you look at the ESS functionality, uh, option, it's going to stay unchecked in ESS. So it's not like you have to go in and redo this all over again. So, um, so here, you know, it's just kind of an example of what's on that spreadsheet. So yeah, go in and take a look at the spreadsheet um, from the extract and see what's in there. Um, that's the only way I'm, I'm really kind of learning, you know, okay, I'm going to just view the spreadsheet. This is the stuff then that's going to get imported into ESS. And then these flags, the setup is going to show up underneath my ESS functionality menu option um, in the ESS system. So what uh, we've done here is we've kind of highlighted in blue the name of the file from the extract that you're going to import in. Uh, one thing we have mentioned up here is that if you know your districts do not use leave requests and kiosk, they can skip some of these steps. They aren't using leave requests. There's no reason uh, and no need to import groups, group members, subcategories, the workflow, and the workflow levels. Um, so these steps, six through 10, can be skipped if they are only using kiosk for pay slips and W-2s.
And so these are all the different options and we do want you to do them in this particular order. Like I said, you can skip these if they aren't using leave requests, but we want you to do it in this order. And, and yes, so it's just kind of showing you in here, here's my next one, the leave configuration types. How do I wanna, um, I wanna import that stuff in. <clears throat> And then you'll notice too, and you know, we keep updating this if we encounter any type of errors that you've received. Um, if you guys have created a ticket saying, I'm getting an error when I'm doing users, then um, we need to make sure that we enter that information in, um, kind of like we did with the errors that we did with inventory and USS and payroll um, when you were doing the uh, migrations. Um, but we'll make sure that we put those type of errors and include them in here. Sometimes it's really a bug, you know, that we need to hot fix so that error doesn't happen. Um, and so obviously um, we're not going to include that since we're going to hot fix it and you shouldn't encounter that type of error. But, you know, as you're going down in here, you'll um, see, you know, I think some of these scroll down a little bit. Yeah, you've got some possible errors that you could encounter. So this is for the leave request uh, re approval workflow information. So, so this deals with the group chains. Um, and so you could encounter some possible errors in there. So um, we are listening. Can we talk about this list. one? Can we talk about this one, that box, sure. what that box means? I think sure. I know what that box means, but the yellow right above it. If the building IRN is used for workflows, you will want to verify each building code included in the workflow is correct. So those building IRNs and USPS is not unique and could reference more than one building code. When multiple codes are found for the same building IRN, all codes are included in the workflow. So that's where you, you might come into the situation, Andrew, where you have multiple buildings that you know have the same uh IRN included in them I'm just thinking you know um when you're looking at those codes um building codes in USPS I think that was one of the things that we recommended in um part of our conversion guideline is to make sure that information is entered in um okay. so I think I have a district where it's not tied so the way I understood this was if you tied multiple building codes to the same IRN, that could cause problems. I think I'm having a problem because I think this district doesn't do, have any building codes set. Uh, okay. Like two IRNs, right? Like in the old kiosk, so I'm looking in their import file right now and I see all the building IRNs listed. And that's on the mm -hmm. position screen in USPS. So like those things are identified with an employee but the building codes don't in core are not linked to those irns could that be what's causing my problem but those yes. building codes are not referenced on the on the import spreadsheet just the building irn column so how does it know And I know that this is the issue because the records that got rejected are the ones that have the building IRNs on them and the records that imported are the ones that have the department codes listed on them. You know what I mean? Like, so I know that that's what's happening, right? Okay. So, it, okay, it, let me go. Oh, go ahead. I just, it's an interesting, it's like why... Where do the building codes play into this? Because the building codes aren't on the import spreadsheet the building irns are on the import spreadsheet let me look here for a sec so the build so in usps i want to ver verify the following prior to importing in core codes, you will need to ensure building code types. Building IRN contains a valid IRN for each building. So that's not an issue, Andrew. Those are okay. I mean, they, they all contain. We must just be doing something in the background that like, like, 
so no, no, there's no, like, none of the building codes in USPS have any IRNs attached to them. But that wasn't a problem in kiosk, right? Like, right. the codes, right. the codes were in, the building codes were their own thing, and the building IRNs were their own thing. That was coming from, like, the EMIS, info, EMIS related information on the position screen is a, I assume, I mean, from doing it, that's definitely what it was doing. I guess I don't have to assume it. That's where it was pulling from, you know? And so now there's like a layer where the building codes are being involved, even though that's not what's on, right? Like it doesn't say building code. It says department code and building IRN, you know? Right and here. so, right. yeah, exactly. So I'm confused where the code, like it must just be validating something or, you know, I smart mm. programming, smart, insert smart programming answer here, you know, right. like, um, <laughs> well, why don't you, why don't you send that in a ticket? Um, okay. I will. And let us yeah, look into that to see. I don't know if it has something to do with this, why you're needing to put this in here. I, but again, no. that's. It is listed, I, you know, had I, you know. And I don't know if that's, that. that's the reason why. Yeah. So but okay. th we can at least confirm it, you know, if you create the ticket, okay. we can see. Yeah. That's good. Okay. And so, yeah. So for a lot of these here. So obviously for a lot of this, um, like I said, you may see some type of error messages and those messages are going to appear. Let me give an example here. Um, here's an example of importing the users um, and those messages, those error messages will appear here. Plus it'll create a file too of the error messages. Um, and the way that this behaves then is, you know, if it's obviously something where you're like, oh, you know, um, this is something that um, we need to fix um, in kiosk in order to correct the error, then that's fine. But um, what I would recommend instead is um, if you do encounter some type of error that you know you need to correct um, in order for it to import correctly, you can take this CSV file that is generated, whatever the name of it is, um, and then you can um, open that in Excel, make the changes in there, and then you're going to upload the newly changed CSV file in here in order to fix those error messages. Um, our concern is if you import and let's say, you know, nothing loaded in, then it's probably safe to say you can make the corrections in kiosk and, you know, and do that extract and, and get that information. But my concern is if you go in and you realize that there are changes and half of the information imported in and the other half didn't, you go make a change in kiosk, you, the extract file is created and then you import the newly updated extract file, you're going to not only, you're gonna do, you're gonna have duplicates. It's going to, uh, repost those ones that did successfully update um, in addition to the ones that, you know, that uh, you fix the errors on. So, you know, you want to make sure if you do have errors, you're not sure what the errors are. It doesn't indicate anything in here in the manual. Please create a ticket. Um, but if it's something that you feel like, okay, I think I know what's going on. You want to make the change on the CSV file that was generated from this import make the change, then go back in and upload that file to fix those errors. The CSV file is only going to contain the um, items that didn't import. So the ones that you got the errors on. So in here too, another reason why we want you guys to go through the steps um, in the proper order is because we do have a sinking positions and a sinking of the leave balances in the middle of here. Um, and if I go back up to the top, you know, you'll see that those are steps four and five. So basically, I want you to do steps one through three, go in and sync your positions and the leave balance information from USPS. 
um, and then continue on with the rest of the steps. So again, make sure that you do this in the right order. Okay. So just kind of circling back to the PowerPoint here, I think I covered everything, you know, in regards to the setup. You know, you got, you know, actually installing, which, you know, from what I'm hearing um, on this call and what we've experienced with tickets that you guys are running test, you know, imports, you guys are setting up blank instances, you're getting things ready to go. And so, you know, that's where, you know, the installation guide is helpful for that. And then in the user manual is to, you know, look at the conversion guidelines because it does provide some helpful tips and stuff that should be done ahead of time, as well as what's done during the process. And then, um, you know, the extracting data is telling you what you need to do to Kiosk to get those files out of there. And then the import from Kiosk guide, then we'll explain how you go in and import those setup, that setup data from Kiosk into ESS. And, you know, like, you know, and like Andrew had commented before too, once that information's in there, you know, and you're syncing uh, leave information and you're syncing position information, you know, you're kind of just looking at that stuff because it's, that's coming from USPS. So you can't go and take a leave balance that you see in, um, uh, you know, in, in uh, ESS and compare that to all of their outstanding or all of their leave requests in uh, kiosk, it's not going to balance. Um, so, you know, you just want to kind of just spot check to make sure that what you're seeing in ESS, like their leave balances, are the leave balances they have in USPS, which should balance because it's syncing it. Um, so just stuff like that, when it comes to, you know, leave requests, they're not coming over. So you really can't be doing any balancing there. Um, you know, making sure that the users are out there and they have the right roles. Um, those roles should be coming over when you um, import the users. Um, the only role that will not probably come over is for you guys. Um, you have that uh, ITC kiosk administrator role. And so when it, and we'll talk about that when we get into users, but um, you'll probably have to have a different method of uh, getting your accounts into your districts. And I, we will touch upon that when we talk about users here. Don't we'll get into that now. Okay. Any questions in regards to just the setup information? All right, I'm gonna move on here. All right, so this next part is, um, you know, like I said, we are, still, and like I said earlier, that we are working on the ASAP integration and how this will be handled. And, um, I don't have all the information, you know, and I'm being honest with you guys. I don't know like when exactly this is going to go out. They are working on it. I know I spoke to the development team yesterday and there are two integral pieces that they're still working on with the ASAP integration that won't, that aren't available right now in the current release of um, ESS. So um, that, you know, they are working literally day and night to get this done so that all the ASAP pieces that need to be there uh, when we go live in production will be there. Um, and so what, and you know, if we need to have another session about ASAP integration and talk specifically about that, probably a good idea. Um, and, you know, we can include maybe some of the development team on that and just talk about the integration so that you guys feel more comfortable about it. Um, what, um, I would just wanted to talk about are like possible scenarios and how ASAP integration is currently working with kiosk um, in regards to how the district is using ASAP 
in how this will be handled in ESS, because I know you are all aware that, you know, we are not doing a bi-directional integration. It's going to be one way. So ESS is going to pull information from ASAP into ESS. So it's pulling the information is just, yeah, pulling it in. Um, so yes, so ASAP is not like pushing the information to us. We are, are going in and pulling information from ASAP. And so I wanna talk about how that's working currently with these <laughs> two different scenarios. So the first one is um, a district is currently using ASAP only to submit and approve their leave requests. So they are not, the entire district is using ASAP. It's not just certified staff, everyone's using it. They are not using the leave requests, the workflows in um, kiosk. <clears throat> so how is that gonna be handled in ESS? So they would continue using the same, they're gonna migrate as normal and they will continue using ASAP to submit and approve their leave requests like they have been. So that is not gonna change. So um, in those uh, import kiosk data information, we do have step 12 in there that um, is in regards to the ASAP configuration settings. So in kiosk, there is an ASAP configuration area in the kiosk configuration that talks about all these different template numbers. Um, and so that is going to be included in one of those extracts. And then those templates are going to be imported into ESS so that that stuff doesn't have to get imported in again. And where that information then is going to be displayed is underneath system configuration, there is an ASAP district configuration. That's where this information will get imported into. So if you look at this screen in ESS and you compare it to the screen in kiosk, they are pretty much identical. So all of that information from kiosk will get imported into here. Um, so that step 12 is very important in our kiosk import steps if they're using ASAP. So like I said, the it's one directional. It's just going, we're pulling that stuff in. So when ESS pulls those leave requests from ASAP, when they come into ESS, they'll be able to see them underneath their leave requests, um, you know, my leave request, they'll be able to see them. They're all going to show as approved. I want to point that out because there is nothing that indicates in the workflow status of where that leave request is in ASAP. We don't have that information. When we pull it, it doesn't tell us if it's initiated, if it's, you know, in a, you know, in process, it's been partially approved, it's been fully approved. We don't get that information from ASAP, pull it in. So when those leave requests come in, they're gonna come in as approved in ESS. So that leave request may still show as initiated in ASAP, but when it gets pulled in, it's gonna be pulled in because we don't have that information as approved. Now, this district is using ASAP to do everything. So they're going so, and that's what they should continue doing. So they're going in, turning their leaves, they're approving their leaves in there. They're, I'm assuming, extracting the data out of e uh, ASAP to import into USPS. They should continue doing that. They can, they can go into um, ESS and view their leave requests, but there will be no workflow for them, obviously. It's already an approved status. They did the workflow in ASAP and they can look up their leave requests in here if they want to. So they still have a way to see that. 
but they can't go in and make changes because it's one direction. We will never, we're not going to push any updates in ESS to ASAP. We are pulling from ASAP, but we're never going to push information back into ASAP. I hope that makes sense. When that information gets pulled in um, to ESS, I believe it will have, um, it'll be designated with an external ID and an origin of absence management to indicate that these leave requests came from ASAP. Um, and I don't have a screenshot or any of that. Um, I don't have anything in here, but I'm assuming when you know they're looking at their leave requests, it'll have some kind of, of designation in the leave request to show that. As to when we do the polls, I believe it's on an hourly increment. So um, if that changes, uh, we'll let you know. But um, from what I um, confirmed yesterday, um, those polls that we're doing for ASAP are done every hour. So yeah, so I know that those leave requests are in here and they're showing as approved. Um, but you know, does the district really want to go into ESS then and export them out and then post them into USPS? If they do that, you have to remember you don't push data back to ASAP. So if they go in here, you know, they're, they're getting pulled in, they can see them, and then the payroll person comes in here and exports them out. The leave request changes from approved to exported, right? But in ASAP, it's not going to update that if they're posting it to USPS via ESS. If they export the information out of ASAP, and post it into USPS, it's going to change the status in ASAP to uh, exported or whatever their status is in there. When we pull every hour, it will go out there and, and find those leave requests and update the status in ESS from approved to exported to show that you know, they have been exported and um, assumed post posted to USPS. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on that? So that's scenario one, where it is strictly the district is using ASAP. Everyone's using it, certified and classified. The other scenario, and we don't know how often this is being done. Um, I don't know if, you know, I don't know if districts are using ASAP solely or they're using uh, kiosk solely, but in a hybrid situation, which is scenario number two, um, they may be using ASAP and kiosk. Now, from what I'm understanding, unless you guys um, have any other comments, if they are set up where their teachers, their class certified staff are using ASAP, obviously, because they need to do a sub call. Um, and their classified staff are using kiosks to do their leave requests. Uh, from what I'm understanding, what happens is the workflows have to be in kiosk for everyone, for both groups. So even though they do the sub call in ASAP, then what happens currently is that it's going in then and the once it's um the leave request is initiated the workflow is happening through kiosk if they're using both they're required to do the workflows in kiosk only so unless you guys say something different that's the behavior that uh, we are seeing so you got to think about that because right now they have districts or, or staff teachers that are submitting their leave requests in ASAP, and they have classified staff that may be submitting their, in, their leave requests in kiosk. All the workflows for both groups are being done in kiosk. 
um, because kiosk then is pushing information back into ASAP because it's bi-directional. Well, we aren't doing that, so it's going to be one direction. So the biggest change with these districts that are using this type of method in scenario two is that those certified staff, those workflows have to be done and created ASAP. They cannot have them in uh, ESS. So the workflows for their teachers, for their certified staff, the workflows for the ones that need subs need to be created in ASAP. So those uh, users will submit their workflow like they normally do or submit their leave requests like they normally do, but the workflow will go through ASAP. And then it'll be um, exported out um, into, you know, into ASAP um, to be posted in the USPS. So um, I, I think I just want feedback from you guys as to if you have districts using both ASAP and kiosk and, you know, and your thoughts on this particular one, just to know that, you know, right now, you know, if they don't have those workflows created in ASAP, they are going to need to create those. Is that going to be, an, an, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe we'll get lucky and no one has any. If you guys are out there looking, okay. <laughs> so. so I'm talking about um, I'm talking about scenario two. So, uh, scenario one, everything's done in ASAP. So um, they the workflows are already set up in ASAP, right? For scenario number one. Scenario number two is where we have users that are using it in both kiosk and ASAP. So those that need, right now, those workflows only exist in kiosk. So for those that need a sub, they have to create workflows in ASAP because we aren't doing a bi-directional. Awesome. Michelle, for Scenario two, you're saying that for like the certified, they would do it through ASOP, but um, the classified people, because they don't need subs or they won't need subs, they will do it through kiosk? They will do it through, through ESS, correct. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I'm looking at kiosk here. Yeah, I'm just talking about like what they're currently using and yeah and how it will be handled in ESS, but you're correct, Brenda, yes. Classified or those that don't need a sub, I don't wanna say cla just classified, but those that don't need a sub, you know, can continue using, you know, ESS, but those that do need a sub, their workflows need to be created in ASAP. We only have one district, so I need to check with them to see how they're doing it. And that's why, um, we just wanted to mention this to kind of, you know, let you guys kind of take a look at that to see, you know, what kind of scenarios your districts have. It looks like some of you say that everything's set up in ASAP. It's great. And we will document this too in our FAQs to say, you know, for those of you that have this type of hybrid situation, you know, this is what needs to be done. Basically, those, you know, staff that need a sub will need to continue, you know, they have been submitting their leave request in ASAP. Now the workflow has to go through ASAP before it was going through PS. So that may require training in ASAP for those approvers um, and things like that, because um, they, you know, we're used to doing that in kiosk. 
Michelle, can I interject a second? Um, yes, Brenda, Brenda brought up the fact that she has a district that's hybrid. Um, if you keep it that way, they will, the approvers will need to go to both systems to approve. That's the only distinction. And like I said, we will document all of this too and lay it out so you guys kind of know um, how this is going to be handled with ESS. We just kind of wanted to bring it to your attention at this point, just to you know, kind of maybe start looking at your districts to see exactly um, how their you know leave you know workflows are being set up and how they're using ASAP versus kiosk. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, this next slide, um, again, is some of this is more review of how users are set up in ESS. So, you know, this is kind of uh, new to all of us. I mean, yeah, we've had users in the old other systems, like obviously USAS and and payroll, but not a ton of users like we're going to have now for each district in ESS. So it's a big difference. Um, so we just wanted to talk about what happens, whether um, it's imported from kiosk, whether it's a new user added in ESS, whether you're using Active Directory and how you're handling your access um, for each uh, district. So um, when you're importing from kiosk, again, there's going to be a user extract. So again, it's coming from that no USPS file, uh, kiosk extract file. And there's a specific CSV file in there for the kiosk users. And you're basically going to download that file and you're going to import it into the kiosk load. Um, so when you do that, I think, and I don't know for most of you, but um, just experience that I've had, usually their username is their email address. And so, and that's fine. You don't want to be going into that spreadsheet before you import it into ESS and making changes to it because you could uh, corrupt it and then it won't load properly. Um, so, um, and so if you go in and import them and all the usernames, you know, are their email address, that's, that's okay. Um, you know, they can continue using those or um, you can go in and uh, mass update their usernames um, in, uh, in ESS. We have a user on the user grid in there. We have an extract that allow you just go in there. And we have an actual extract here, export grid items that you can you know, select all, obviously, except for the admin. You will never be able to change that here in the application. Um, but um, it'll pull everything into a spreadsheet then that you can mass update their usernames and load those no new usernames in here. Um, so, you know, if you want to get away from the email as the uh, username um, and maybe they're using Active Directory, um, obviously, if they're using Active Directory, you know, probably already set, you don't have to worry about it. But if they're planning on using Active Directory with ESS, you want to make the username their Active Directory username, um, and then you can load those in. Um, another thing, too, when you're importing users, it's not taking the password. So it's just going to be taking their user information, first name, last name, um, their role will be in here, their email that was in kiosk. And so that type of information will get converted in, will get pulled in. But obviously, when it comes to the password, those need to be uh, reset. And we do have a bulk reset password that allow you to do that, to reset them. So I believe for the user then, when they uh, log in or when they um, go 
go to the actual login page to log in, there's going to be a place where they can change their password and they can reset it then to what they want to use in ESS. Um, but, you know, this will, you know, allow you to reset the password so that they can at least go in and reset it to something that makes sense to them. Um, and when it comes to resetting these and stuff, right now, when it comes to, I think, resetting, uh, making editing changes, both the admin and district manager can do that. When it, when it comes to creating new accounts, I believe it's just users with the admin that can create new accounts in ESS. Um, I don't know if we've got, um, I think we might have a Jira issue maybe um, to maybe update that, but I believe that's how it's currently working right now. Is that you? I think they updated admin. that on the last release because we were remember on the the yeah. prioritization working group meeting we were like, because mm. yeah. when we realized we were going to have to be the ones to add all their new users, I think every ITC person on the call was like, mm, no, you know. Cool. I, no, I knew we had heard it from somewhere, Andrew, but I'm like, I know yeah. we have some. We're like, we, okay, we're going to do I think, I think it is. And I think they already, I, heck, I think Mark did it while we were sitting there in the <laughs> yeah, meeting because yeah. the, the response was pretty strong. I mean, I don't really, I agree. I don't really want to update all their users for them. That's a lot of people. Yeah, or give somebody the admin role at a district, it, you know? It's like, like what the you district, the district what's that role called? Like district supervisor or something? Because it's not admin, because he said they Man changed all the roles with the word admin. Manager. Manager. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that one has. Yeah. The ability to do that now. Okay, it good. Has. Thank you. I knew there was something. Okay. Um. And one other thing to note too, when it comes to um, your role, you know, like I said, you guys have in kiosk, and, and you have to kind of remember this as, you know, how it behaved with classic and when you SAS and payroll is that we didn't have like user accounts in each of our districts, you know, uh, information. Um, so we had to go into use SAS and payroll and create all of those. Um, for our ITC staff. And so the same behavior here, the ITC kiosk administrator role is not a role that is recognized in ESS. It's not in here. Um, so uh, what I would recommend doing um, is when it comes to, so, you know, obviously your accounts right now in kiosk have this ITC, you know, kiosk administrator role that allows you to go into any of your districts and view their data but you don't necessarily have an account for that district. Um, so your account just gives you access to everybody. So when, you know, you're, you know, loading those user um, imports into ESS, it's not including ITC staff, it's just including the users of that district. So what I would recommend doing instead of creating each of those manually is I would have a spreadsheet of your ITC staff um, and you can use our um, user documentation as a guideline it's going to contain, um, I'll go in here. And I think I might have it under, maybe I don't have it in here. I might have it underneath the user import. So let me go down to system. Look, I'm getting stuck in here. All right, let's go back to place of service. And we go into the user manual and underneath system, we have, I think it's the mass load. Yeah, we have it underneath here um, because the only thing right now in mass load is the user import. So basically you can create a spreadsheet of your ITC staff and you can use the import criteria here um, to entering your information, 
Um, the only thing you cannot do with the ICC staff, because you'll all probably have maybe the admin role. Um, uh, if it, and, and if you don't, you'd rather, you know, the ICC staff district manager, that's fine. But um, I'm assuming that you guys will probably want the admin role. It cannot be assigned via mass load. Um, so that is a restriction. Um, it's not recognized in there with the mass load of users. So I would not include the role column, um, create that spreadsheet, include everything else needed for the ITC staff. And then what happens then is when you import, you know, you're going to mass import. So if you've got 10 people on your staff that you want to have in each of your district's users, um, you're going to, you know, and load that in. And then from there, you will have to go in and edit the ITC staff and assign the admin role. So, you know, just a handful of them. So it's not going to take very long, but I do wanted to point that out that, um, you know, so I would just continue using that spreadsheet and just keep loading it in each of your district's instances uh, with your ITC staff. And um, it, you'll get that, you know, it won't take long at all to add everybody. So kind of similar to what we had to do with the other applications. Okay, and I think I covered all of that. If the 80 set up, like I said, the username has to be the same as the username um, <clears throat> that is used in Active Directory. And with that user account as well, you wanna make sure that um, the external uh, authentication is checked for AD access or if you're using Duo, the two-factor authentication. Um, so you want to make sure that that's um, set up. And also um, there, um, the application properties, making sure in that file that the Active Directory information is set up there as well and testing it, testing the Active Directory access to make sure that that's working. <clears throat> if you guys still are having trouble, with AD access and being able to log in using the AD uh, username and password and create a ticket to us and we'll look into it. I know we had some issues and some bugs um, with um, AD um, and I believe that we've worked those out, but again, we might you know come across some other ones. So, um, but yeah, you definitely wanna make sure that the uh, username is identical to their AD username, and they have external authentication check marks in here. Okay. All right, so I think um, I'm gonna stop and Mary's gonna take over and uh, she's gonna talk about some of the uh, application processing and kind of going over a review, some of that information. Mary, I'll stop sharing my screen here. Hey, um, I'm gonna just show what a standard user can, can do inside of VSS. And that's all determined by what um, the district sets up in their system configuration area. So if I go in here and look for the ESS functionality, um, these are the things that they can check and uncheck on and off um, to decide what their staff can see. So that applies to everyone in their district. So this is a um, admin account that I'm using here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and log in as a, as a user. This is my, my new person here. Um, we did go through a lot of this information in the overview in uh, April. So that video is out on the um, documentation training, I'm sorry, the meeting and trainings page. Um, we will probably create a new video for just the user profile when the production releases out so that we can include all the newest enhancements and probably post it in one of the future newsletters. So um, quickly, I will go as quick as possible because I know we're getting long here. Um, 
on their home screen, they can see the announcements in this area and then links over here for a standard user. Um, in the employee profile, all this information comes from USPS. Um, they have the profile information, the contact, the dates, and qualifications. And again, those can be toggled on and off in the configuration if they don't want them to see something. Um, anytime they would want a change in their information, so if I'm changing my address or my name, let me say that they spelled my name wrong, um, I click up at the top there, and then I it will give me a grid to fill in. I'm going to change this to Stacy because uh, they spelled my name wrong. And then I would submit the data change on there. That change um, will go to the data change manager role. So someone who has that role will be able to approve or reject that change. Um, any questions on that area? Because I'm going to move down to positions here. So I did see a question from Andrew, and I will get to that in a second here. Positions, uh, if they are configured, in this case, we have both active and inactive positions. So I'm going to take a look at this one because this is the one I have set up for groups for us today. Um, the custodian position uh, with the building code, the department, it shows the supervisor. Um, and then another important area here is check to make sure these are checked. Um, this all comes from USPS. So if the position has these checked, then this is the type of um, leave request that they can input. So let me make sure I told you everything I wanted to tell you there. There is a um, crosswalk that's in the documentation so you can see which fields this information is coming from inside of UP USPS. Um, in the payslip area, all their payslips will payslips will be listed, and they'll be able to filter by date if they want to. Um, you can either download it or print open the PDF to the page if they want to look at it on the screen. W W2s, I do not have one for this person because this is our demo data, um, but it will list all their W2s. And to answer Andrew's question, yes, the, the old W2s and payslips should pull in. Um, I know I do have a ticket from someone that um, is unable to see anything prior to 2018. Um, so, and that is Brenda. Sorry, Brenda, I didn't see your, your comment down there, but yes. Um, I'm checking into that one with the developers, so we'll find out why um, that's not happening. Um, one other thing, I'm going to drop down here before I get into leave information. Down by their name, there is a profile. This is where they're going to sign out if they need to sign out. Um, and there's also a profile area that they can click on. This will set defaults. So uh, this is has their username and email and they can put a default phone number. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And then they can set a default hour of start time. So I'm just gonna set 8 a.m and the default stop time, um, it's gonna go 5 p.m. So that when I put in a leave request, this will be my default start and stop time. It also shows them their role and which roles they have. They have the opportunity with these two check boxes to opt out of leave request emails, and they can change their screen display to be in dark mode. So if they like to, to see the screen this way, they can do that. And when they're done, um, they can save it. Okay. Let's see if there's any more questions. 
is there going to be a different SOAP call for ESS? Uh, I'm going to defer to Michelle. I don't know. Um, we, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean, Marcia. Are you in regards to? We do have a, um, you talk about like the rest service. Um, information I know will be updated when the user logs in, just like it did in Kiosk. So as soon as they log in, that information will get updated if there's a change on the USPS side. Is that what you mean? So yeah, um, when they're yeah when they log in, it it automatically talks to USPS. So. Yeah, I think it's more automated, um, but um, I'll double check on that one. Let me check on that, Marsha, and I'll get back with you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and look at uh, leave information. On this screen, um, there's three tabs. Um, all of them uh, do come from USPS. So what you're going to see in here is the leaf balances as of the last exported um, amount that came out of ESS. Their absences are listed. And these, again, are the ones that have been exported. So anything that has not been exported is still sitting in ESS. They can filter for a particular type if you wanted to look at just your sick leave or your... Um, professional leave, you can do that. Um, and it, you can filter by any one of these fields actually. Um, so that helps them to restrict between years. Accumulations, we um, have this on a different tab so that they can see all the accumulations from each of the paychecks that they received. Um, they're sick and they're personal. And if I wanted to see just my personal, I could do that. Um, I think that's all I had. So on the leave requests, um, I can go in and create a leave request here on this screen. And I will get back to this a little bit later after Michelle and I discuss the groups and group chains. Um, and then I can also look at my leave requests that are in process. And uh, you can see here, I have one that's initiated already and waiting to be approved. I can also look at the calendar to see my leaves and what I've already uh, requested. Once timesheets are ready, this is where they will go in. Um, if it's enabled for this district, they would go in here and look at their timesheets and they can also um, input their daily work, work that they've done. The help screen um, will give the, if you check the about information, we'll give you the version number that they're on and um, the build date. And they can also look at documentation. Can't have enough of that. And then, the development tools they will not see. This is only because we have a support um, instance here that we're using. So that's why it's showing up for them here, but it will not show up in a production version of the software. So did I, um, Michelle, did I have all that for the a user and what they can see? And the next section is gonna be groups and group chains. Sounds good. I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so the next question basically is, what is a group and how? Can I easily see the details of that group? Okay. So as an administrator, um, they can go in under users and groups. And we can think of groups as the approvers. 
So inside of the group, you can name it whatever you want. You can create a group to have the approvers listed in there. And I'm going to select the one that um, I created yesterday. I named the group custodial approvers. Um, and then I'm creating it as an and group. You have a choice of and or or. Um, my supervisor that I'm going to put in there is Brenda Mullins, and she will be the approver. Approvers, uh, the groups always have to have a approver, one or more. You cannot save it without having an approver in there. The second I put, the second person I put in there is M. Bailey Morgan, and she's going to have read-only access with notifications. So it's close to being the same as it was in kiosk. The second part of this would be to create um, a group chain that I want to use for the custodial workflow. So in this one, I'm going to create a custodian workflow and I'm gonna give it a priority. And then down here are my filters. Um, I currently have a specific employee that I want to go through this workflow. So I put her in there. If I did not put her in there, I would have the option of picking department codes, building codes and subcategories. Um, coming up and they are currently working on it, you can just put supervisor uh, in the group. So I'm gonna go back a second, let me go back here. Instead of putting the name of the person, in the approver, I can put the generic supervisor right here for an approver. That currently is not ready yet. It's coming and should be ready by next week. Um, so once that happens, then you can generically put in a supervisor and it will take that person's supervisor, no matter who it is in USPS, and that would become their approver. So in the group chain, then I'm gonna go back there. My I decided to just put that employee in there. And then if I wanted to have a second level for approver in here, I can select, let's just say the superintendent as a second level. If I drag that over, then my first level of approver is the supervisor group, which means the supervisor will get the notification and, and approve, and the um, office manager will get the notification and view so that they can see. Superintendent then would be the second level to approve, and then that would be, that would complete the approval process. Okay. I'm not going to put that one in there because I want you to see um, the approved one currently. So in essence, that's how you would create the group and the group chains and how you can see them. So you would go through the view area to see them. If you need to make a change, you can edit. If you need to change the priority, you can do that within that same edit. The one thing that um, could happen is that a person could fall into more than one uh, group chain. If that happens, the priority would take effect. So if you had it as priority one or two. Um, and if there's a tie, for example, right here, I have two custodial leave flows. Both of them are priority one. So where would I fall into, right? it's going to be alphabetical as the tiebreaker if you don't have it set up correctly. Um, I can have every one of my 
uh, org chains be a one, but you don't have to do that. You can set them up the way you you need to for the district. Um, the last thing I want to show you in this area is there are times when someone's uh, this. ESS system does not require someone to have a supervisor in order to be pulled in here. If that happens um, and the workflows are all uh, set up and they don't have a supervisor to go to, they might fall through all the, the group chains. What we suggest is to set up a, a workflow uh, called a catch-all, and I set one up here. And what you do is you set up I named it the manager because the leave manager is going to get all the ones that fall through. Then they can decide, oh, we got to do something about this person because I keep getting their leave requests and I shouldn't be the one that is approving them. I should go back to USPS, put a supervisor in their position, and then it'll go to their supervisor. So the catch-all person for me is going to be the uh, ma uh, leave manager. So in the groups, I have set up a test manager. That's going to be my catch-all, and that's who I moved over here. And that's who will get all of the ones that fall through the group chain. If I go back through the groups here, I'll show you. The test manager is the leave manager. So when you... Um, Go to create one. Let me, um, I apologize. I'm going to go and create one here so that you can see where I got that. So when I go down here to manager, leave manager, this is a generic, again, like supervisor. And I can add that person there and that becomes um, my catch all. You can put whoever you want in there. It doesn't have to be the leave manager. Okay. Hey, Mary. Yes. So if somebody hits the catch all, right? Mm -hmm. And then we go, let's say we go change them. We go, ah, oh, that's not right. You know, like, then do you have to like refresh? You know, like in kiosk, you had to like hit that refresh button, you know? To get them to reroute is there a button like that in here no what will happen is it goes into um when you when you change that it will change on the next one and resubmit the leave for the next one okay so this one then can't be like it can't be fixed kind of a thing like it's going to the leave manager they have to approve it Yes, and then when the next time that they go in there, if they had uh, fixed that USPS area and given them the the, the supervisor, mm -hmm. then that will go to that workflow, that group chain. Okay. Now, if they but reject it and then they change it, I'd have to test that. Like they could reject it and then change the, you know, make that change. I believe mm -hmm. the workflow will pick that up on the group chain and resubmit it. It just does that um, in the background, it will resubmit. Okay. Okay, so I'll go test that and make sure that that actually works the way. I'm just thinking if it can't be, you know, if it can't be reapproved, I'm thinking most districts would want like, maybe like whoever the leave administrator is to be the first one in the catch all group, but then like the superintendent, because that way then, you know, if, if the superintendent just has to temporary approve a leave, that's probably fine. But like maybe payroll doesn't want to be the only one temporarily approving a leave because it went to the wrong place. Right. Yeah. Whatever, wherever the district wants it to go, they can enter those people in. I know that was pretty quick. And then after Michelle um, talks about um, notifications, then I will come back and show you the 
the and I'm going to enter a leave and follow it through to the end where after it's approved so you can see it on the calendars. Um, are there any other questions? Hey, Michelle, stop my share. Sorry about that. I didn't mute myself. Um, the next one is, do I need to set up an email notification before the district starts processing in ESS? Um, and what email address is used when an email notification is sent? So I just kind of want to go through, um, you know, where that information's at. Okay, so under... Um, system, and then the configuration option, where there's a lot of information underneath this configuration option. But in here, we do have the email configuration that is very similar to what you guys are used to seeing in um, inventory and USAS and USPS. Um, so that same information um, would need to be set up in here in order for the email configurations um, to work. And also, um, there is a spot where you can um, test an email notification too. Um, and I believe that's down here underneath system. There is a test email option that, you know, you can go and test an email, um, put in a specific user's email address and just, you know, see that that email uh, setup is um, being handled properly. So I don't think we have anything like that in uh, the other applications. So that's kind of nice to have that option. Um, and then uh, one thing I want to talk about going back to configuration is the different emails that are sent. Um, and so uh, underneath, and I think I always, I think we need to change this because I never can find it. We've got a leave request workflow configuration, I kind of wish it said email workflow configuration, but in here is where the default emails and what they're in from, you know, and what they're going to show is listed. Um, so I'm just going to edit this so we can kind of go through each of these options here. Um, and so um, we have, if you look here, we have five different type of email uh, uh, default um, settings here that, that'll be sent based on who's sending it, who's receiving it. So the request submitted email de details. And what's nice is when you hover over it, it kind of explains what that does. Email sent to the leave request submitter when the leave request is submitted for approval. So this is the originator. So when they send, submit a leave request, they are going to get an email. And if I open this up here, um, and it basically shows you what, and I'm just looking at this area right here, um, what is going to be on that email. So it's the subject of the email is going to say leave request initiated. And then the body of the email says, a leave request has been submitted for the following details. And you'll notice this little variable down here that is basically linking the details of the leave request in the body of the email. So that originator can see that their leave request was you know, submitted. It's just like another confirmation to say, okay, my leave request went through. Um, and it's, you know, was submitted to the first uh, uh, area of the of, of my workflow, the first person of my workflow. Um, and so that's and so they you can go in and make changes to this. You can edit this if the district wants a little more information in here, they can. Um, but you know the only things that variables that we have right now that can be inserted are note, leave request, and a link. 
And these are already being used in the default setup. So this is the default email. It can be enhanced if they want to add a little bit more information in here. Um, but that's what this request submitted email details includes. Add a whole lot to it. And if, then if I collapse that one and go into this next one, this is the approver email e detail. So this is the email that's going to be sent to each approver in a group when a leave request requires their approval. So what's nice about this one, again, it's very simple. It just says you have a leave request that requires your approval. And it again includes the leave request details of the staff member that they're approving. So it'll provide that, that so-and-so wants to take sick leave on this day using a half day, you know, something like that. And then it also includes this variable, the link variable, where basically it provides the link to the ESS application so that the approver can just click on that link. It'll take them right to ESS where they can log in. And then obviously when they log in, that approver grid is right there when they first log in and they can go to that specific person and approve their lead. So that's what this approver email does. And again, they, they can you know, enhance this if they wanna add more information to it. Um, the request, email approval um, information. Again, if I hover over it, the email sent to the leave request submitter when the leave request has been approved. So the originator then gets um, an, uh, an email saying the leave request has been approved. And um, any note uh, that was added, like when the approver went in to approve the leave, there's an area with a note box that they can add information in there. Uh, maybe they rejected the leave and they want to explain why. Maybe, you know, they, so many people already had that, that day off and they need them there. So they put that information in there and that note information will be included in here and also the information about the leave request. So the originator knows, okay, it's been approved or it's been rejected. Here's a note with an explanation why, it's not required, that's optional. And then my leave request details, so I remember which leave request I had submitted. And then the leave request uh, rejection is the email sent to the leave request submitter when the leave request has been rejected. So they can receive an additional email for that. Um, and if I go over there, it just says the leave request has been rejected with the following details. So I'm sorry. So the approver is when it's approved. And then if it's rejected, they get a different email saying it's been rejected. And again, the note as to why it was rejected and then the details of the specific leave request that was rejected. So again, this is what the originator, the submitter of the leave request is going to receive. And then the escalated email is sent to the leave request submitter when their leave request has gone through an escalated approval. So if for some reason, their leave request has gone through an escalated approval, then they are going to get an email regarding that saying that the leave request was, and if it was approved then, and a note if there is one, and the actual leave request information. So again, they can go in and make any changes here if they need to, um, and it will um, you know, make that change for that district. So as to extra things that they wanna put in here, yeah, maybe on down the line, you know, we can do an enhancements. Um, to add other things in here, but um, for now, this is kind of where we're going to be at for a while when it comes to the, the leave requests. But, you know, it, we do have the technology that, you know, we'll be able to maybe add more variables on down the line, so. Okay, I think that's all I had to discuss, so I'm going to send it back to Mary, and she is just going to go through an example of a leave request, creating it, um, and going through the approval through the export, kind of from start to finish. Hey, um, so I'm going <clears> to... <throat> 
I'm going to go, let's go to my leave request so I can show you what already is in there. I have a request in there from the 27th. Um, so now I want to create one. Okay, there you go. Uh, first, they need to be kind of careful if they've got more than one position that they're going to put it on the correct position here. So, and that is a required um, field. I want to pick uh, a sick day. And since I had set up my profile and put in uh, the start and stop times, those are defaulted in. Um, so I don't have to do that. I can increase this to one day. Um, by the way, these the total time is configurable also on the system when you go in the system menu. Um, and then they have the option of filling these two things in. If they need a sub, they can click here to uh, put a sub in. And if they want to upload a document, they can drop it in here. Um, and they can uh, provide documentation if needed by the by the district. So that's all they have to do, and then they can click on create leave request. So that message there tells me that it's been created, um, and it sets me up for another date. So. I'm gonna go in here again and look at my leave requests. And you can see I have one for the 27th and one for the 28th, both initiated. So now I'm gonna go log in as um, the supervisor. Mary? Yes. Oh, sorry. I wanna see, could you try actually entering a request back under that person where like they don't have any time available? I think I saw where they didn't have any vacation time available. And I want to see if you get the same error that we have experienced on our end and if it lets you go through. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. I tried to catch you. Okay. And also, like, maybe we try it with the same day, too. So I think if we go back to leave balances on this person, I yeah. believe that when we, when you joggle uh, when you were there, it showed a zero balance, right? Yeah, zero balance for vacation. So in the example that we did, we entered like a balance that was more than what they had available. So in this case, if you just put like one vacation day. Okay. And then it gave us like the pop-up warning, you know, that it's going to go over your time. And I said, okay. And it went, and then it gave me another error like it didn't go through. So then I went in and I requested it again and it duplicated it twice for the exact same day. Yeah, I think I, I did test that and it did give me the error message and I went through it, but it didn't give me that second message that you received. So that one I did send off to the developers to take a look at. So this one was vacation because there is no vacation. Um, right. And it, it gives them this message at the top here telling them you don't have any but we're gonna to try to take it anyway, right? Right. And I want vacation on July 5th because everybody's gonna be off. And this um, makes it July 5th from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. one whole day. I can put in whatever else I want and then create the leave request. Oh, I forgot to oh. tell why. Okay. It says successful. So it created it. Um, and the configuration in this system is that I can go over my, must be set up to where I can go over my balances. Um, can you try I, to enter it the exact same way and see if it duplicates for you too? Sure. And I had that for the fifth. Five PM total time one. 
Okay. Okay, that's the first message that I did get when I duplicated it. And I just said create. That should have given me that the first time. Well, this one I think is saying you're entering a, a request that already exists. Yeah, but this part here where it's making it go negative. Oh, yeah. That part and then too, it yeah. says you can create or cancel. Yep. What did you do when you had it? You created it? I clicked create. Okay. So then, yes, it would create another one. These two right here. And it allowed us to approve duplicated yep. requests. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's the current behavior, isn't it? Yeah, you're allowed to have um, more than one leave because it's assuming you can have two different kinds um, morning, afternoon. But this is for right. a whole day. Right, so you're you're duplicating right. over the same time, even yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for going through that. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So she's entered her information in, and we're gonna go in as the supervisor now, so you can see that it comes up on the screen. Let's... Okay, so I got a, a, when I get on my landing page, this is what the approvers will see. And they can approve right from the screen if they want to. Um, they also have the option of going to uh, leave request approval down here on the left side, and they will get a list of ones that they can approve. Um, because I know that Stacy made a mistake and she had vacation in there and shouldn't have. I can click on these two and say reject, and it'll go back to her. Now I can go in and approve all the rest of these if I want to. I'm gonna take this one out because he's not, he wasn't one that I put in today, so. Um, Laura has the 27th off and 28th off sick. So I can approve those. I don't need to put a note in if I don't want to. And I can look at, as a supervisor, my calendar. And I can see that Stacy's are uh, Sick leaves are both on here, plus some other ones. And then she has a separate calendar for herself. That part is done. I wanted to make sure I... Okay. So I'm going to go log back in as uh, Stacy. And I want to go look at my leave requests. Um, and on her screen, I can see two of them are rejected and these two are approved. If they need to change something when it's in the initiated status, they can do that. Um, show you this area here. When you go in and look at a request, you can see all the details. Um, you can see the daily details as well. And if you made a mistake and you need to change something, you can do that in here. And oops, I, I always do that, sorry. Should just go back up to the top there. 
Um, the last item is the leave trail. So here they can see that it was submitted by Stacy and that Brenda um, rejected it. So if they have to go back and see why, you know, something happened, they can go back and check it. And if they need to delete a request, they can do that right here. They can cancel the request. So if I clicked on this, it asks me if I want to cancel this leave and I can say yes. And then if I go to my leave calendar, uh, it still left it in there. I'll have to check that. Okay. All right. Um, the supervisors would need to have the role of uh, um, approve leave requests in order to do that. Um, and they can also have supervised, view supervised leave so that they can see everything. I'll go in as, um, well, I need to go in as an admin, hold on, which I'm already there. So if I look at Brenda uh, Mullins, and I want to search for her because there's a big long list of people, right? I can just start typing the name in and it'll bring her up. So she has leave request approver and leave supervisor for staff as well as the user. Um, she also has substitute, but the these two give her the what she needs to do the leave. Um, approvals and to see the leave on the calendars. Um, any questions on creating the leave? Because the next thing I was going to show you real quick is where um, they can go to do an export. Anything else? Okay. So for exports, the it would be the they need to have the um, role of leave admin. I'm sorry, leave manager, and they can go to first place would be leave requests. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to log in as that uh, my person here. So to export a, a leave, they would go into leave requests and then export leave requests down here. And they can do it for certain dates. So if I just wanted to export on, um, let's see, Stacy is right here. So 628. And then I can export that. And then it asks me if I wanna do it through a CSV or directly to USPS. Um, this time I'm going to do it directly to USPS and export it. So this will tell you if there's any errors and um, if my Excel opens up today. Let's see. 
So this is a report that tells me uh, there are no errors. So one record was successfully processed. Then if I want to look at the history, I would go to um, leave management right here and export leave history. So on this one, I can uh, view what was submitted. So I'm gonna view um, this one, uh, Stacy had gone. And then I can either revert the leave details or export it again. I have choices there that I can do that with. If they um, revert leave details, it only removes the status flag from those records. So if the payroll person already uploaded that information, um, they all need to know that this is going to come again if they um, resubmit it. So they got you need to be careful when you do that that it's not actually removing anything out of USPS. It's only removing the flag in employee self serve. Are there any questions on that part? Okay, Michelle, I'm gonna um, send it back to you. Okay, I think that covered like our um, FAQs for um, today. I know it went way over and I sincerely apologize for that, but I think we got through a lot of good information um, and just getting more comfortable with employee self-service. Um, and so, you know, we're going to be, you know, keeping in constant communication with you guys in regards to the production uh, instance and, or the production uh, when that goes live. Um, and also, you know, anything else in regards to ASAP. And, you know, we are working on making sure that uh, we get the, documentation updated as well in regards to all of that so um yeah we're, we've got a lot a lot uh to do before um we are in the production mode of ess and like i said once you know we that is to the point where it's ready and it's considered production um we will absolutely send out an email notification to all you guys through SSDT notices announcing that. Um, and I, I have to add um, that uh, I was um, texting, uh, chatting with Mark a little bit and just um, for um, his uh, chat message um, or his notification, it, he's got crunch time listed um, in there, which I totally get because he's you know, trying to get all of this out in order to get everything ready to go by the July 1st deadline. So it's probably going to be working all weekend to get this stuff done. Um, but um, like I said, we'll keep in constant communication with you guys on that. And any questions you guys have, please send out a ticket. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. This is going to be new for everybody, um, but we're hoping this session today just kind of got you a little bit more comfortable with the um, conversion steps, as well as, you know, some of these options in ESS to get you started. So we appreciate everyone's time. We hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And like I said, don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions that you have. Thanks, everyone. Michelle, can I ask a quick question real quick? Sorry. Sure. Um, do you guys have like a, um, like a template for the migration questionnaire for the district. So I know like when we migrated USAS and USPS, the auditors required that we have like the sign off from a district on migrating, you know, their software to a new software platform. 
Yeah. I don't know if that's yes. going to be required or not. I don't know if you guys have heard of that or if you may already have like a template built for that for our districts. We have not. Um, we have not had any anyone requesting that. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a requirement for the auditors. I guess we can, we'll write that down and kind of, we'll ask uh, Matt about that, if that's something that needs to be done. But um, where I know that there used to be like a kiosk, like an agreement saying that mm -hmm. um, we know that we are, we are not going to be doing an ESS. Um, but as to, I know what you're talking about is that agreement that we had with them saying that everything was migrated successfully and stuff, but um, you know, we're not yep. doing any type of like, you know, thorough balance, you know, balancing in here like we had to do with the others. Um, but, um, but yeah, I'll check with Matt and see um, Thank you. if that was something he may have discussed with the directors and stuff. But as far as I know right now, we don't have any of those um, requirements. So any other questions? All right. Thanks again. We'll get this out here, um, posted to our um, registration page, and we will see you guys all next week for a recap. Have a good one.